I, I put up on the screen just one example, and this is from a Canadian perspective. Um, back in the late 1800s, 1897 to be exact, a, 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 gr a transport subsidy was, was put in place and enacted in legisla legislation in Canada uh, called the Crow Rate, and it helped develop Western Canada in the early part of the century. It was a, a transportation subsidy that set the rate for uh, for transportation costs uh, at railways to, to bring grain and agriculture products to ports of export. It was put into legislation, very rigid, and it remained in legislation uh, for the better part of a century, uh, this particular rate uh, uh, subsidy. Um, but what happened in the early part of the, the, 19, in, in, in sort of the early 1900s was this thing called inflation that not a lot of people had experience with at that point in time. And that really started to cut into the ability of railroads to, to earn profits. And uh, a big sort of unintended or unanticipated implication of that uh, policy that was enacted in legislation was a severe sort of dilapidation of the rail system in Canada, which really came in stark relief when uh, Canada started to export more, to, more grain to, to Russia and China in the 1960s. And the rail system almost virtually collapsed due to sort of under repair and, and maintenance. Uh, it took a series of about six commissions uh, in the course of about 20 years to actually unpack and understand the impact of such a rigid policy over time. And uh, during that period, uh, uh, of course, a lot of impacts happened. And the policy had to be eventually overhauled and a number of mechanisms put into place in order to review costs over time and put in agencies to, to, to assess the, how conditions change and to change the rates and be, make them more responsive to varying conditions. So that's sort of just one example of a policy that really was quite rigid over time and, 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 and there was sig uh, significant consequences and how changes were put in place eventually uh, to improve that system. Many examples uh, in, in all regions of that, of that type. So at the uh, Energy and Resources Institute and also at IISD, we, we spent a number of years unpacking and understanding sort of the, the policy settings that we're working in. We studied high profile policies uh, in Canada and India to, to, to understand uh, uh, the context uh, that these policies were operating. We talked to people impacted by policy and we compiled examples of policies, of features of policies and plans that made them adaptive and effective in changing circumstances. And we used climate change or, or weather variability as a backdrop of uncertainty and change in which to study how responsive policies are. So while the, 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 the features and tools that uh, I'll mention briefly here over the next uh, 10 minutes uh, were developed in the context of, 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 a, of a variable sort of climate backdrop, the principles are really quite extrapolable to any dynamic situation or any sort of a, uh, policy setting that, uh, that may be outside of, of, of just uh, dealing with, with climate. Here's what we discovered and observed. Policies uh, dealing in those types of settings have really two, two abilities that are really quite crucial and are important to think about in terms of adaptive planning in just about any setting. And one is the ability of a policy or plan to adapt to conditions that we can anticipate being smart about what we can see into the future and what might happen. But there are always going to be the unknown unknowns, the things, the surprises that no matter how smart we are and how much, how much analysis we do, there will be surprises that will occur that will challenge us and we'll have to address. So the ability of a policy or a plan to deal with the unanticipated is crucial and just as or more important than a policy or plan that is doing a lot of analysis to, to prepare itself for the future and uh, put in place mechanisms to deal with what can be anticipated. So these are very important to unpack these two different things and understand planning uh, for sustainable development in that context. So let's look at a number of uh, different uh, tools. So seven tools in particular that we observed, and these are experiential policymakers in India and Canada are, are using these, these various tools in different ways and we found successful examples of their use. But seven tools. Integrated and forward-looking analysis. Very crucial tool that we'll talk about in terms of being able to deal with this uh, sort of 
with anticipated conditions. So we might categorize those as sort of tools that deal with uh, a planned adaptability. So this is the ability to, to anticipate and, and, and see forward and see the integration interconnections. Multi-stakeholder deliberation contributes to that ability to anticipate by bringing multiple perspectives into a room. And we all have experience with doing that. Um, there's a tool that is used, which is referred to as built-in policy adjustments, where if we do anticipate the future, we can actually, at the front end of policies and plans, build in triggers to enact changes over time that we know will actually happen uh, when certain conditions arise. We've seen that. And we'll show a few examples. We have uh, formal policy review uh, processes that are in place sometimes, uh, uh, not all the times. And when they're in place, they don't always work. And we don't extract the lessons that are important uh, for, for policy making and planning. The idea of variation and redundancy and diversity is really crucial in, in complex adaptive systems and in planning and uh, uh, policy making, and we'll talk about that. Enabling self-organization and social networking, another important tool. Now these last three are dealing with this other uh, important element, which is to deal and better plan for the unanticipated. Things that we can do to position actors uh, that are on the ground to, to self-organize, to respond to change, because they see it first. Decentralizing decision making to allow actors on the ground to, to respond quickly and, and allocate resources as, 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 as needed. All these things uh, contribute to, do, to two sort of main uh, ways of, of, of achieving adaptive policy making and adaptive planning. And we'll just quickly run through a few of these and, and in a few examples just to, to get a better uh, sense for this. And this is meant to be a very sort of pragmatic and practical discussion of tools and approaches, as this is what uh, the SD PlanNet is, is trying to foster, or these, these, this type of sharing. Integrated and forward-looking analysis uh, is, uh, in a thumbnail, is about identifying key factors that affect policy performance, identifying scenarios for how these factors might evolve in the future, and uh, basically to, to sort of make policies more robust to a range of these anticipated conditions. If you can do that up front, that is good. But if we can't do that up front, what are the triggers that can implement change when certain conditions start to materialize in the future? That's all about this, this forward-looking analytic multiple perspective tool. And scenario planning uh, is a process that can help achieve that. Um, sometimes it's, it's called stress testing. And if you're in the financial sector, you're doing a lot of stress testing right now uh, to, to examine your vulnerability to uh, in, in sort of in, in, in economic instability that we've experienced the last few years. So the financial sector is looking at stress testing and scenario planning as a tool to look forward. Uh, we will talk about this as a policy wind tunnel on Wednesday in terms of the details of how to do this. And we'll spend some time on an exercise to help a policy stress test its, itself for the future. Multi-stakeholder deliberation is not just about gathering people, stakeholders in the room to legitimize a, a plan or a process. It's about providing different perspectives in the room because in a complex system, no single epistemic community can really think about and even understand the situation and propose a solution. So we need as many minds around the table of diverse nature in order to plan for solutions. So that's really quite critical. And then that process of deliberation creates and helps foster social capital and, and, and linkages between people and shared visioning and that is very important for, for planning in complex settings. Uh, we see examples, and, and Srija will talk a lot about this on, on Wednesday in Maharashtra in terms of uh, participatory irrigation management and, and watershed planning. Uh, local watershed management groups in, in Maharashtra uh, uh, sort of locally organized and that sort of allowed opportunities for face-to-face -face deliberation on various issues from water use to to uh, picking uh, different sort of cropping uh, patterns that's, that might be more suitable in future conditions and, and there was some notable impacts and changes that occurred uh, for, for the positive. So deliberation and integrated and forward-looking analysis are two multi-perspective tools, one from an analytical sense and the other from a deliberative sense. Very critical. Uh, of course, formal policy review we have experience with, but don't always do it well. 
and don't always put it in place when we start to